Hi guys. Let me just admit everybody to the class. How's it going? Okay. <clears throat> so, um, well, uh, I think we've got mostly everybody. We'll give it just a minute. Um, what I'd like to do today is we'll spend the first half of the class period. I can answer questions from the homework. Um, I want to go over, there was one, um, the, uh, I forget which one it was. Was it number 30 or 28? I don't remember from the homework that um, I hadn't completed. I wanted to finish that off um, for you guys today. And then um, also um, we can go over the homework stuff. I want to talk about the quiz that we took last week to how do we interpret that funky graph? We had to look at the limits on everything. Um, some people are asking me questions about it in office hours. I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. And then um, second half of the class, we'll finish up chapter 2.2 and we'll start chapter 2.3. 2.3 is a two day thing. We're going to start it today. We'll finish it on Monday. Okay. Um, remember your quiz, uh, your homeworks today for chapter 1.5 and 1.6 are due um, are due tonight at midnight and your quiz opens up at noon today and it goes until noon tomorrow. Um, be careful, we have found out that um, if you start your quiz before noon but you finish it after noon, Canvas will not allow you to upload the quiz. So make sure that you start it um, with enough time so that you can upload it. Um, and have everything set um, and ready to go before 12 o'clock tomorrow. Okay, so that means that you need to start the quiz no later than 11 o'clock tomorrow morning, okay? Because um, you want to give yourself, it's a half hour to take the quiz and then 15 minutes to take a picture, scan it in, upload it, okay? It'll give you a little bit of margin for error. Okay, um, let's see. There was a question, I can't remember, I can't remember, I think it was number 28, maybe um, in class. Yesterday we were talking about um, our first derivative test and I had only done like part of it. Um, so I just wanna go over that um, homework question first um, before we do other stuff and get my pen. So, um, so this is um, chapter 1.5, question 28. I just wanna finish that up. So we did this yesterday. This is um, D is the demand. Um, and we were given a demand as a function of the price. So the demand was 10 P squared minus 200 P plus 1000. And we were told to restrict the price to be between zero and $10. Focus. Thank you. I hate it when it does that. Is it just slightly out of focus? There, that's better. Okay. <clears throat> and we were, um, our revenue as a function of price was just the price times the demand, which makes it um, 10 p cubed minus 200 p squared plus, whoops, plus 1,000 p, okay, and still the same restriction on our price for the revenue. Um, so let's write zero, okay. All right, so now that's the only thing we needed for part A. For part B was intervals where our revenue is increasing or decreasing. our p, which means I need to take the derivative, um, our prime of p, we took the derivative, we got 30 p squared minus 400 p plus 1000, okay, and then we set that equal to zero, and we solved, we found that p was um, 10 thirds, which is like three and a third, we could leave it as a fraction, um, and then also 10. <clears throat> so now I have these critical points here, I'm going to do um, first derivative test on these essentially where I look at what's happening with um, my derivative um, around these values. So the intervals that I'm going to set up, then I'm going to set up are, I'm going to go um, minus infinity to 10 thirds, which is actually zero to 10 thirds because we have a restriction on our p values. Okay, so if, it, if we had no restriction, our interval would be minus infinity to 10 thirds, but because we have a restriction functionally, it's zero to 10 thirds. So that's what I'm gonna be thinking. Um, my, let's see, 10 thirds um, to 10, right? And then um, essentially 10 to infinity. Okay, these are um, things. Now this one we'll have to um, reevaluate in just a moment, but let's take a look. We're gonna look at values um, within our first derivative within these points here. So I'm gonna go R prime 
of zero, okay? And that's gonna give me, so I'm looking at my first interval here. So R prime of zero, I look at my R prime plugin, I'm gonna get a thousand, which is a positive number, which means that my revenue is increasing. Uh, my revenue is increasing. Then I'm gonna look at um, R prime of five. So that's a value here. So um, 10 thirds, like three and a third. So I'm gonna choose a value somewhere in between here. So R prime of five, when I look at that, I get minus 250, which is a negative number. So my revenue is decreasing. And then R prime um, of 12 gives me, um, 10,120, which is a positive number. So my revenue again is increasing. So what this means though, when we think about, um, sorry, give me a sec. Um, what this means though, when we think about like revenue versus um, price and revenue versus, you know, cost and, and all that is that um, I need to be able to think about how can I price something? You know, I've got this toy or whatever, and I want to find the ideal price for it. Right. And so I want to make it like, if I do a value that's on the outer edge of my price range, I'm making higher revenue because the price of the toy is high, right? But if I if I make the um, price of the toy just right, I'll have higher demand because the, the toy will be like inexpensive enough that a lot of people will buy it, okay? Whereas if it's on the high end, I won't get as many people buying it, but I'll make up for the difference because the price is really high. But what we usually try to do is like capture the market, right? So I'm gonna to try to find a value where, um, so somewhere between, you know, uh, along this interval here, zero to 10 thirds is where I probably wanna price my, um, where I wanna price my, my value. So I'm gonna get this maximum value somewhere around here, okay? So it's kind of like in business terms, like we use this, um, the differential calculus to help us figure out what's a good price point for um, something that we're trying to sell. We wanna price it just right that we get enough people to buy it so that our profits are pretty high, right? But because if we price it too high, then people won't buy it. Or if we, even if we price it too low, our revenues will be too low because um, sure we'll have a lot of people who want it, it's free, but then you know our losses will be too high. So that's kind of how we think about it. Okay. So that was question 28. I, I had um, forgotten to do this part here, so I went back and did that. Um, <clears throat> there. All right, so um, I'll take some questions for some other homework problems. Um, and if you guys don't want to you know, shout it out, it's fine. Um, you can put it into the group chat. I've got that. Um, you can send it to me privately or you can send it to everyone. It doesn't matter. 1.5 and 1.6. And just so you know, um, I had a question um, in the my eight o'clock class. Um, a student asked me about chapter one point six, question thirty six, which deals with um, probability. Um, probability. Uh, yeah, somebody's asking about that right now. So I'm just we're we're thinking of the same thing. What I'm going to do for question thirty six, one point six, it's very theoretical, right? Where I'm kind of working through stuff. I'm going to scan this in and I'll post the solution for it, just so you can see what the solution is. It's more complex than what you would see. On a quiz or a test, and it's also very theoretical, but it is something good to think about um, because the uh, I think as engineering science students, you guys have to take um, probability and statistics, which is 3081. It's a fun class, and and so we talk a lot about probability density functions and cumulative distribution functions, and what do they mean going back and forth. So I think the book is trying to introduce you to um, topics that you'll see later on in your education, and you know how there's you know calculus behind it a lot of these topics that you don't think of probability or statistics as having calculus in it, but there are. So I'll post the solutions for um, question 36 because it's it's um, it's like it took me a full page to work it through and um, and it's kind of theoretical and it's a little bit off topic for what we're trying to do. So um, hold that thought. It's a good question. I'm going to post it. <clears throat> um, let's see, 1.6, 22, and 24. Okay, so let's take a look. I'm just going to go in order in the chat here. So 22 and 24. Um, I think, oh yeah, so these, so 22, 24, these are part of the graphs. Let me, um, let me bring up those graphs and take a look. Um, I can look at them too. So 22 and 24, these are graphs. So um, so question 22, and I'll tell you how, how I'm um, thinking about it. So question 22, the graph looks something like, um, something like, like this and I think you know this is my 
look something like that maybe you know these are are hard questions because um like the the tick marks aren't very great you know it's hard to get a really good um estimate of what's happening if you're doing a ballpark on here it's totally fine right um but what you want to do is being able to interpret the graph now we're learning algebra behind you know exactly where are the critical points where are the inflection points and and everything like that but they're just trying to get you to see if you can eyeball it on a curve but um so for here if you're within the right ballpark i'm okay with the answer but let's just talk about it so increasing intervals now these are intervals of x so it's increasing from minus infinity to one it looks like to me i'm assuming it goes down to um infinity and goes out to infinity even though our graph just cuts off i, I don't know if it does or not i'm just making the assumption that it does um, which means that my, um, let's see, and then I'm going to write, it's decreasing, I have down here, it's decreasing from one to positive infinity. Now, even though we're eyeballing the graph, the boundary points from where it changes from increasing to decreasing, right, you can see how if the graph itself is continuous, there are no discontinuities, this should be continuous here in my intervals, right, so it increases it stops increasing at one and it starts decreasing at one, right? So see how there's a, they share that boundary there. Um, and then uh, I think, let's see. So that means um, I have to say, where's my second derivative? Um, my second derivative is negative, I believe, from minus infinity to minus. So it's the whole thing is concave down is how I'm reading that graph on 22. Um, <coughs> 24, I'm looking at the graph here. So 24, I'm just gonna do a quick sketch here. So 24 looks something like um, those. There's a little blip like that. And then this thing, I think it just passes over like that. So um, this is kind of like, this is question 24. So you're interpreting the graphs on these again. Um, so 24, I said, um, was increasing. These are x intervals again. These are intervals where x is increasing. I'm saying it's increasing from minus infinity to minus 0 0.5. So from right about, you know, up to here maybe. And then um, and then it's also increasing again from 0 0.5 to one. And then again from one um, to infinity, um, I guess. Um, yeah, oh yeah, and I broke it up into two different intervals because it looks like, I don't know, but it but I'm, looks like there's some kind of an asymptote here. They didn't draw it in there, but I'm that's what it kind of looks like to me. So I, I broke it out because there's a discontinuity, I think in the graph then I broke out my two intervals like this because I couldn't continue them because it looks like there's something like an asymptote here at one. Um, where was it decreasing? I, it looked like it was decreasing from minus 0.5 to positive 0.5, right? So you can see how there's a gap here and where it's increasing. So I wanted to say where I thought it was decreasing from here to here, essentially. Um, <clears throat> 24, I thought that um, my second derivative was positive minus infinity to minus one, and then again from zero to one, that makes it um, concave up. And I thought my second derivative was negative from minus one to 0 0.5, and then again from one to infinity, and that made it concave down. Okay, so being able to interpret the graph is, um, you know, is an important thing, right? All right, <clears throat> did everybody see how we did that? I mean, I know, and, and like I said, if you're within a, you know, within plus or minus one on the graph, you're in the right ballpark, I'm fine, you know, how you're answering this stuff, but make sure, <laughs> make sure that, you know, unless there's a gap, right, like some kind of a, a major, like you've got this vertical asymptote, um, and then there's some kind of a major gap, make sure that you've got, or if it's a piecewise function, make sure that you've got, like, that these boundary lines, that they don't overlap. I mean, that, that they overlap, right? So 0 0.5, minus 0 0.5 to 0 0.5, minus 0 0.5 right there, you can see are the same. Um, uh, let's see, 1.5, question 30. Um, is that the, um, that's the population, population question, I think? Okay, you guys have this thing in it. Um, okay. So chapter 1.5, question 30. All right, so um, 1.5, question 30. So we're looking at, um, let's write down, so we have a population <coughs> given by the function P of T. 
um, which I'll write down as um, minus t cubed plus t 10 t squared um, from 0, 0, 7, and then, sorry, um, t squared plus 14 t, and then from t graded. Okay, so we're given this population function here. Um, so for part A, um, no, let me get the question in front of me. So, this is question 30. I'm just going to read it really quick. Question. So um, question 30, um, show that this function is continuous, find the critical values, um, describe the in intervals on which the functions increase and decrease. Okay, all right. So um, <clears throat> I'm looking at um, E of seven. So I've got this, right? So I go from zero to greater than seven, right? So I'm kind of looking at when this function is greater than zero, right? And so I've got this, you know, spot at seven where I've got a changeover in function. So the thing is, I want to take a look at, you know, where is that happening? So seven is the point where I want to be focusing my attention on. So P of seven equals, I'm going to plug it in minus seven cubed plus 10 times seven squared um, equals 147. So all I did was I plugged in this boundary line into my top equation. Um, and then I'll call it P1, P2, I'll call this P2. P2 of 7 equals um, 7 squared plus 14 times 7 equals 147. So these two have the same <clears throat> value, right? So I'm not, I'm, I could graph it out and then just kind of see like where these functions, do they overlap or not? But basically what happens is I've got a cubic function from 0, t equals 0 to t equals 7. And then I have a quadratic function from um, greater than, uh, when t is greater than 7. And so at that point where the functions change from cubic to quadratic, right they're actually they share the same function value so that means that there's a continuity that they're continuous now let's also take a look so the functions defined the same um both of these functions are the uh, same value at the same x spot or t so now i'm going to take a look at my limits because that's how i'm really going to prove my um continuity as well so my limit <coughs> is t approaches seven from the left hand side right which means for values that are less than that so i'm looking at um minus t cubed plus 10 t squared, right? Um, and this is kind of like what we just did, but does the function approach it? I mean, because we can have this like function that's, it does something, it approaches some value, but it's defined somewhere else, right? But so the function's approaching 147 on the left, limit as t approaches seven on the right. And I'm using my, this is approaching on the right, where t, oh, it's greater, t squared plus 14t. And that's also equal to 147. So this is, um, same value on left limit and right. Okay, so if my limits are the same, the limits are approaching the same value on either side and my function is defined at that value. It's the same function value definition. That means that it's continuous, right? But given these two, the functions defined and the limits are the same on either side, therefore it's continuous, right? Okay. It's continuous for t greater than zero, essentially. Okay, so that's part A. Part B says, what are our critical values? Let's scroll up a little bit here. Um, so I'm going to go zero is less than t, which is less than or equal to seven. Okay, so that means I take the derivative in this range here. I'm going to get um, minus three t squared plus 20t. Now remember, I know formally we haven't learned the power rule yet, but for the quiz and for the homeworks, chapter 1.5, 1.6, you can use the power rule. It's fine. So I'm taking the derivative. <clears throat> I'm setting it equal to zero. And I'm going to solve t minus three t plus 20 equals zero. I'm going to get t equals 0 and t equals 20 over 3. Okay, so those are my critical values. So now, um, or do my critical points, critical points. 
to get the critical values, these are our y values, right? Remember, our critical points are x, critical values are y. So I got to plug these back into my function to find out my y values. I go p, not p prime, but p of 0. And give me 0, right? Um, p of 20 over 3 is going to give me, um, remember I'm plugging this into my top, so 20 over 3 cubed plus 10 times 20 over 3 squared, and that's going to give me 148.1. So my critical values are 0, 148.1, okay? That's for that first function. Now we need to do it for the other function. P greater than seven. I have to check my other function. So P prime of T equals two T um, plus 14. Set that equal to zero. I'm finding my critical points first. Take those critical points, plug them back into my function to find the values. Be very careful. Um, like we try to trick you, right? I'll tell you ahead of time. We try to trick you on the exam and on the final exam. We say, what are the critical, what are the critical values? So, so that means you have to find the critical points, plug them into your function and find the Y values. We say, what are the critical points? You just do this and you're done. Critical values implies Y. So be careful, don't fall into the trap of giving critical points and then forgetting the rest of it, okay? All right, <clears throat> so I set that equal to zero. So T equals minus seven is not in our domain. Okay, so it's not in our domain. So these are the only critical values I have to worry about. Okay, because I don't, the critical point that I get from this algebraically is not in the domain of the function that we have to find. Okay, so I'm not even going to bother plugging it back in and getting a value because it's not, not in our domain. <clears throat> okay, part C says, where is it increasing? Decreasing? <clears throat> All right, so we've got our critical points, right? So I, um, I'm going to be taking a look at, oh, give me just a second. Okay, I'm going to be taking a look at, um, my intervals are going to look like 0 to 20 over 3. Um, and I'm going to look at 20 over 3 to 7. And then again, 7 to positive infinity. These are my intervals that I need to check because I found my critical my critical points, right? So I need to be able to figure these out. Okay. And I'm doing seven, right? Not because of this, this is a minus seven. So don't get confused, that's not the same thing. The seven is where we have the change over, change in functions. Okay, so I have to use that as my boundary marker for where things are gonna be changing and I have to look at my intervals differently. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's do the first one. So I'm gonna look at prime of one. So p prime of one, so I'm looking um, at a value between here. This is my first interval. So I'm going to go minus three times one squared plus 20 times one equals 17. It's positive. Okay, that means along the interval zero to 20 over three, it's increasing. Okay. My derivative is positive. My function is increasing along this interval you read that p prime of six right we're looking in this interval here so i'm going to look at minus three times six squared plus 20 times six equals 12 that's positive so then i'm looking at um uh, let's go 20 over three to seven um and then i did there's something else that kind of happens that's funny i noticed um uh, this kind of gets broken down. Like as I get really close to um, seven, I, I noticed it was like 6.75. I went really close, minus three. Um, when I plugged it all in, 6.75, I got a minus 1.68, which is a negative number, which means it's decreasing. There's a little micro inter um, interval in here too. And then P prime <clears throat> of seven is my changeover, right? Because I'm getting really close to that value, this seven right here. All right, and then um, there's three, seven squared plus 20 times seven equals minus seven, which is decreasing, okay? And then, um, yes, yeah, so it was positive. And then 
e prime of a, I'm in the next interval up, so I'm using the next derivative, 14 equals a positive number, so it's increasing. Let me, let me summarize. So to summarize, I've got 0 to 20 over 3. That interval is increasing. Um, this one, so 20 over 3 is like, is 6.666 um, repeating, right? Um, so then uh, this was 7, this was decreasing. Then um, did seven to infinity. This was increasing. Okay, to summarize. All right. Um, one point six number sixteen. I'm. Uh, let's see. We'll go through maybe. Um, do these here, and then um, we'll head up. Okay. Um, so 1.6, um, it looks like we have to do something similar where we have to show that it's defined and continuous. Um, so I'll fill out those, we'll talk about that. Um, and then that's 1.6 number 16, and then 1.6 number 45. All right, so give me a sec. We'll do these um, couple problems and then we'll move on. 1.6 number 16. <coughs> So 1.6, um, number 16, we've got g of x equals, I'm in the right chapter. So g of x equals um, minus x squared when x is less than or equal to zero. And then we've got x squared when x is greater than zero. And so I just kind of graphed it out just to see. So when x is positive, I have this like positive parabola, right? And when x is negative or zero, I get this reverse flip. So instead of the parabola shaping up this way, it kind of looks like that. Our function does this, and it changes over at zero between our functions here. All right, so um, the first question is, is g of x continuous at x equals zero? Because x equals zero is our changeover where we're defining, where we're going from one function to another. So I'm going to look at the limit as x goes to zero from the left. And I'm looking at minus x squared, and that's equal to zero. The limit as x goes to zero from the right of positive x squared, that's equal to zero. So these are the same um, function value. I'm sorry, the same. I'll do the function at same limit value on left and the right. Therefore, the limit um, exists. And now we need to do the function value to show that there's continuity. Um, <clears throat> g um, of zero equals zero. I'll call g one. G two of zero equals zero. Same function value. That's kind of like the problem that we just did. Same function value at x equals zero. Therefore, it's continuous at x equals zero. So that's part A. Um, <clears throat> Part B says, um, I forget what part B says. What's our derivative, maybe? I have it written down. Um, g prime of zero equals zero. So g prime of x is going to equal to minus 2x for when x is less than or equal to zero. g prime, um, sorry, equals um, 2x for when x is greater than zero, right? <coughs> and then g prime of zero, right? at that point is going to be equal to zero either way. Either way, right? No matter which function I use, at zero, x equals zero, my derivative is going to be equal to zero. So that's my critical point. All right. Um, does g double prime of zero exist? OK, so let's take a look. So my g double prime of x, right? So when I take the derivative here, I'm going to get minus 2 for x is less than zero. I get positive 2 for x is greater than zero. Hmm, it doesn't look promising, right? So let's take the, the limit of our second derivative. So the limit as x approaches zero of g double prime. Okay, that's what we're looking at right here. I'm sorry, g double prime of x. So now if I go the limit, 
as x approaches zero from the left of g double prime of x, I'm going to get um, minus two, right? Because I'm approaching it for values that are smaller. And then I'm going to go limit as x approaches zero from the right. G double prime, I'm going to get positive two. Oops, my limits are different. Different. So even though, um, right, well, well, let's take a look. So our, our second derivative has two different values that um, <clears throat> essentially has two different values regardless of what our x is, right? And the limits are different, right, as I approach zero from either side. Okay, so that basically means that um, g double prime of zero does not exist. Okay. That's how you would handle question 16. Let me take a look at 45 really quick. Forty-five is like um, I had to put into words a bunch of stuff on forty-five. So up there. So this is um, chapter one point six, question forty-five. Okay, so now um, I've got uh, I have to sort of put into words the information that they're giving me. So they told me um, part A says what are the the number of unemployed people at the start is nine point four million. So that means I can say um, a t equals zero. <clears throat> um, I'm looking at u of 0 equals 9.4 million. That's my initial value, right? Um, B it says unemployment was increasing by 500,000 people per month. Oh, look, that's a rate. People per month is a rate. 500,000 after one month. So this is t equals 1, right? I'm looking at u of 1, but this is a rate, so it's got to be a derivative. The derivative evaluated at time t equals one is going to be 500,000 um, people per month. Okay, we're just interpreting the words that they give us into like math type of thing. Part C says at t um, t equals nine, the num number of unemployed people was increasing, but the rate of unemployed people was decreasing. So um, <clears throat> we're talking about different things, right? So one is a derivative, one's a second derivative. So let's write it. So t equals nine. So I'm going to say um, u prime of nine. This is my rate was increasing. My rate of unemployment was increasing, but the um, the number of unemployed people was increasing. So the rate of people per month was increasing, but it was increasing very slowly, or increasing the the rate at which it was increasing was um, had had slowed down. This is negative that's all that you're doing for 45 you're just kind of like putting into math the words that they gave you okay all right um i'll answer the rest of the homework question stuff that you guys have i'll do those in office hours if you want to come to office hours and we can talk about them there um but for right now i want to um move on so we can finish up um chapter 2.2 and then um get a head start on 2.3 at least start on that all right <clears throat> so Yesterday, we left off with a quotient rule, right, which gives us a way of taking a derivative um, when I have a function over a function, right? So bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared. It's like a tweak on our product rule, essentially. All right, so we, um, we're going to keep working through examples for this, right? And then we'll finish off, and then we will start on chapter 2.3. All right, <clears throat> so we're looking here. Um, we want to take the derivative of this. Now remember, my derivative of e to the t is e to the t. Okay, so when I go to take this derivative, I have to do the quotient rule. Okay, so when I do that, I'm going to go bottom, e to the t plus t, times the derivative of the top, e to the t. Looks confusing, right? Because I'm not changing anything, but I've actually just taken that derivative. Minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. So this bottom here, so e to the t plus 1. 1 is my derivative of t. That's my linearity, right? I can take the derivative of each piece and then add it up all over the bottom squared, quantity squared. Okay. Now, technically, you're done, right? You found your derivative. You can just put a box around it and move on. We're going to clean it up a little bit. I'll just um, clean it up so that you can see what things look like. But technically speaking, um, I'll accept that as an answer. Let me put a light box around it. So let me just um, multiply everything else. You can see how the exponents add e to the 2t plus e, e to the t minus e to the 2t 
I just need to repeat all over. Third, now I can cancel some terms out and I can factor out an e to the t. So I'm going to get e to the t. Okay, this is nice. It's pretty, right? It's very compact. Um, this is the same thing, but I just I did some algebra to um, simplify it. <clears throat> okay, so let's do this one. Whoops. Um, example six. So find the equation of the tangent line. Be careful. Um, make sure when you're doing tests and quizzes that you're reading the whole question, right? So this, some of you guys lost points on the quiz last week because it asked for the equation of the tangent line and you found the slope of the tangent line very nicely, but then you forgot to give me the equation for it. Um, so then you lost points. So make sure you're reading. If it asks for the equation, we need to come up with you know, point slope form, uh, slope intercept, I don't care. Point slope is your easiest bet. Okay, so let's go ahead and work through this. So we're given at x equals one. So my first thing is f prime. I have to find the derivative. So this is a quotient. So I'm gonna do my quotient rule. So bottom or x cubed plus one times the derivative of the top, six x plus one minus the top, three x squared plus x minus two times the derivative of the bottom, 12 x squared <clears throat> all over. bottom squared. Okay, I'm not going to worry about cleaning up the algebra because they already told me x equals 1. So I'm going to do my derivative evaluated at x equals 1. I'm going to plug in my 1 for x and then combine all my like terms and get a number. I'm going to actually plug in the 1 so you can see what I'm doing, but in reality because it's a 1, you can just multiply through. Um, <clears throat> so 4, 1 cubed plus 1 times 6 times 1 plus 1 minus 3 1 squared plus 1 minus 2 times 12 all over 4 times 1 cubed plus 1 squared. Okay, so multiply it all the way out, combine, I get 35 minus 24 all over 25, which gives me a slope. So this is my function, it's doing something. At x equals 1, it has a positive slope. That slope is equal to 11 25ths is the slope tangent line at x equals 1. Okay, so now I've got the slope. I need to figure out a point on that line. Okay, so I'm going to put it in point slope form. So this is going to be y minus y naught equals m x minus x naught. Now I just figured out the m. I was given x naught when they told me do it at x equals 1. So all I'm missing is y naught so I take my x equals 1 and I plug it into my function. Be careful. If you plug it into your derivative, you're going to get your slope back. So I plug this into my function. So f of 1, so 3 times 1 squared plus 1 minus 2 all over cubed plus 1. And that's going to give me the point um, <coughs> that's my y value. So the point on the function and tangent line to one comma two fifths, right? So our function is doing something at x equals one. That's where we're doing our tangent line. That's where the tangent line and the function share a common point. That's this right here. So now I have a point. I've got my slope. I'm going to just plug it into my equation. So y minus two fifths equals 11 20 fifths x minus one. Box it and you're done. <coughs> Point slope form is really great. You know, we get kind of caught up in the y equals mx plus b because we do that a lot in algebra, right? But um, point slope form is great because I don't have to do anything else. I just plunk things right into place. Okay. I'm going to do um, one last example um, with a circuit because I'm not sure if you guys have a question like this on a homework. I can't remember. Um, maybe. And then, um, but also certainly as engineering science majors, you'll probably see problems like this. So it's good to kind of, you know, get acclimated to how you think about them and how you work through. So example seven, I've got a circuit that represents a battery and the circuit's very simple, right? I've got a battery connected to a resistor here and there should be ground. Um, <clears throat> so now, right, um, this little r is our internal resistance okay, for the battery. The voltage is like, so this stuff here is a constant, like I take a battery out of my, you know, out of a package and I plug it into a circuit. 
So I've got this voltage, I've got the internal resistance of the battery. This resistance here is the resistance that's associated with my circuit. Okay, the battery is going to provide a certain amount of power that's given by this equation, B squared R all over R, big R plus little r quantity squared. Big R is the resistance for my circuit. That's the thing I'm going to vary and see how much power I get out. Okay, but V and little r are constants. Okay, so I'm looking for the change in power as I change the resistance. You know, where, where can I maximize my power, you know, given that I've got an, um, you know, what, what resistance do I have to set my circuit to to maximize the power out of this battery? Okay, so um, that's kind of like what's being asked. So remember, V and R are constants, and we're taking the derivative, dPdr, this is with respect to big R. So always we're looking at big R. So when I go to take the derivative, I have to do quotient rule, because big R is a variable. Little r is a constant, big R is a variable. So I've got a function over a function. Big R over big R. Okay, so let's go ahead and do it. So dp dr equals, right? So bottom r plus r squared times the derivative of the top. Remember, if big R is my variable, v squared is a constant, right? I'm just going to do the power rule with big R. So it just becomes v squared minus the top v squared r times the derivative of the bottom, 2 times r plus r to the one power. You don't know what I just did the chain rule. Um, we're going to learn the chain rule in just a minute if you haven't learned it already. <clears throat> I have to square the denominator. Don't be tricked into thinking it's already squared. I'm done. You have to square a square, which means I'm multiplying the, um, the exponents. All right. <clears throat> now it's just algebra to clean it up. I'll, I'll do the algebra so you can see what we're trying to do here. All right. So now um, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out a big R plus a little r, and I'm going to cancel it with here. So I've got big R plus little r. That's going to be r plus r squared minus v squared 2vr. And then um, there, and then this is going to be plus r all over r plus r to the third, right? Because I factored it out. So now I can cancel here. And then what I'm left with is this. <coughs> And now I'm going to multiply through, right, because these orange, cancel, cancel, right? So now I'm going to multiply through my v squareds, okay? So what I'm going to get is, um, it'll like v squared r plus r minus 2r. Actually, what I, I didn't multiply through, I factored out. r cubed, okay? Now I'm going to combine. So this becomes v squared. And this is dp big R. Okay, so that's my derivative. I just had to do a bunch of algebra. Now part B says we're in the graph of P versus R. So P versus R. So remember our, um, let's do a graph. My R. This is my p. Remember, your p is equal to v squared r over r plus little r squared. Right. So I can um, actually plot that as a function. Right. Um, big V and little r are just constants. So just pick values, you know. And then r is your input. Okay. P is your output. So r is like your x. P is your y. Right. I'm gonna plot these out, and I'm gonna get a graph that looks something like um roughly. Okay, so I just plot this on my calculator. Okay, so where is the P versus R? Where's the tangent line horizontal? Where is this? Okay, what's this value right here? <coughs> Oops, sorry. So um, where is that happening? So that means I have to set my derivative equal to zero. So I'm going to go equals V squared R minus R plus R quantity cubed. Right, so, and I have to solve for big R. Solve for big R. So now when I do this, right, I multiply by zero. Um, so big R plus a little r quantity cubed multiplied by zero, I'm going to get zero equals V squared R minus R. I divide by V squared, I get zero equals R minus R. 
I get little r equals big R. I don't even know what these values are, but I know that when my internal, I'll just show you on, the, on this, when my, my circuit resistance is equal to my battery resistance, I've reached the maximum power. Okay. <clears throat> All right, and that's um that's two point two. I wanted to throw that um problem out to you so that you can see it because I think I, you may have like a homework problem that looks like that. Okay. You guys all got that before I move the page. I'll scan this in too later today so that you can. Um, Alrighty, so moving right along. <coughs> chapter 2.3, very exciting. So chapter 2.3. Chapter 2.3, we're gonna break into a couple days. So today, we'll talk about the chain rule. And then on Monday, um, we'll finish up with the chain rule and then we'll talk about inverse functions. There's always a question on like the final exam or the midterm on inverse functions. It's certainly a chain rule we use all the time. All right, <clears throat> let's talk about the chain rule. So chain rule comes into place when we have um, what we call composite functions, a function composed of another function. So f composed of g of x. We, we do this all the time, right? I've got like cosine of x cubed. So this is my inner function. That's my g of x. Cosine's my f of x, right? Um, I could have a radical x plus one. This x to the fourth is my g. This radical is my f, right? So we're always doing these composed functions, right? I mean, they make up the whole world. So now, I mean, I can also write it like this. So my composed function can also look like um, f. It's like an open circle g of x, those are functions, so it looks like fog, but it's it's this tiny little open circle, f composed of g of x, it's a function itself. Okay, so now what happens is, this is a theorem, our chain rule theorem. Chain rule is super important, because it says, right, <clears throat> if f and g independently are differentiable, Functions, then their composition is also differentiable. And we need to define how we do that. Like I have to um, <clears throat> f composed of g of x. If I want to take that derivative, right? What I do is I take the derivative of the outside function take that derivative of the whole thing times the derivative of what's on the inside. And if g of x is a composite function, I gotta take, I gotta do the chain rule again. I gotta keep nesting. I gotta keep taking all these derivatives all the way down until I get all of those functions into play. We're gonna do it, um, we're gonna do examples so that you can see what things look like. Um, and then we're also gonna do it, uh, I'm gonna do it you know, just straight up. And then I'm also gonna do it using a substitution of variables. Um, I sometimes I find, Substitution of variables to be very helpful um, when I'm trying to keep all of my. Um, oh, I lost my. I had a, a printout for. So just give me a second. And I can... My lecture examples. Um, we'll do substitution of variables too. That'll, that'll help. Sometimes I like to do that to help me keep my uh, bookkeeping in order. All right. <clears throat> So I'm on my lecture examples for 2.3. I'm on example number one, y equals cosine of x cubed. I'm gonna find out what's the derivative of y. So like I said, I'll do it first just straight up. So y prime, I have to take the derivative of the outside function. Derivative of cosine is minus the sine. Okay, whatever was the argument on the inside is again the argument on my derivative times the derivative of what's inside, bx. I did the power rule. So I'm going to just make it look a little pretty by bringing this, our, our 
common way of writing it is coefficients go on the outside. So minus 3x squared times sine of x cubed. cubed. Okay. And that's your answer. <clears throat> I'll do it as a substitution of variables just so you can see um, an alternative method. Um, I tend to like to use that sometimes. All right, so I'll say um, my inner function here I'll call u x cubed. I know I have to take the derivative, so I'll just do it right now, 3x squared. Okay. Now that means that my y equals cosine of x, my y, I'm going to call it f of x, y equals f of x, but I'm going to call it f of u. Now I'm going to substitute. It's a cosine of u. Okay. So now when I take the derivative, it's going to be um, the derivative of this times du. So I'm going to go minus the sine of u times du. Don't forget the du, right, because that's your chain rule part, right? <clears throat> and now I have to substitute back. If you give your answer like this, it'll be wrong, because u is just a temporary variable, right? You'll lose points. All right, so let's substitute it back. So I'm going to get f prime of x will be minus the sine, our u was x cubed, times du x squared. See, we got the same answer, right? You should always get the same answer. All we're just doing is a slightly different method. 3x squared sine of x. Okay. <clears throat> I, I tend to like substitution of variables. It helps me keep track of things, but you don't have to use it. Okay, if you like it, go ahead. If you don't like to, um, are the lecture examples for 2.3 in chemistry? So I thought they were. Um, it's possible, you know, sometimes these things aren't, um, let me just check really quick. I think uh, these things, I don't make them public, or, or I think they're public and they're not. Do you know what? It's, um, if you guys can, let me do this, you know, yeah. So they are actually listed um, on week five, which wasn't published. So let me do this. I will publish it right now. So um, I'll move this up into week four after today's class. But right now, if you want to look on Canvas right now, under week five, the lecture examples for chapter 2.3 are listed, and I just published them. Um, and I'll clean up for, um, put up extra stuff for week five after class today. So if you want to take a look, um, lecture examples 2.3 are on week five, and they're just now published so you can see it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, thanks for saying that. Um, I'm going to keep track of all this stuff online. Okay, so let's do the next derivative here. Calculate the derivative of this. So I'm going to do substitution of variables just so I can, um, I can show you and you can see. Like I said, you can decide what you want to do. If you're just learning this for the first time, it might be helpful. All right, so I'm going to say u equals my inner function, x to the 4 plus 1. My derivative of my inner function is 4x cubed, right? The derivative of 1 is 0. So this is f of u is equal to radical u, which I'll write as u to the 1 half. Okay, so I can see it. This is, this is an underline. I've got a little bit less obscure. Looks like it's, it's carrying over the radical, but it isn't. Okay. All right. So now I've got u to the one half. Now when I want to take the derivative, right, I'm going to bring down the power rule right here. So I'm going to bring down my one half, subtract one from that there, and I have to do du. Don't forget the du. If you forget the du, you're going to lose all sorts of stuff. Now I need to substitute back. Okay, so I'm going to plug things back in. So f prime of x equals <clears throat> 1 half. We said u x to the fourth plus 1 to the minus 1 half times du or x cubed. Okay, now I can clean it up. 1 half times 4, that's equal to 2. I'll put the x cubed out front x to the fourth plus one to the minus one half. You can leave it like this, right? Or I can put this in the denominator inside of a radical. So it'll look like two x cubed plus one square rooted. There. These are equivalent. It's fine. Make sure you substitute back. If you don't substitute back, you're, you're going to lose points and get it wrong. Okay. <clears throat> Is, um, get that okay? Um, okay, let's try this one. <clears throat> so when we go to do our 
du, I'm going to have to do um, a quotient rule on that. So let's start writing these things down. So u equals x over x plus 1. So then my du is quotient rule. Okay, so quotient rule says um, du is going to equal to the bottom, x plus 1, times the derivative of the top, minus the top, times the derivative of the bottom, all over the bottom. Okay, so I can clean this up. This is x plus 1 minus x. So x is canceled. So I'm just going to get this is 1 all over x plus 1 quantity squared. That's my du. Okay, so if I substitute this as f of x, I'll call this um, f of u is equal to the tangent of u. So my f prime of u is equal to, so now the derivative of my tangent is secant squared of u times du. Don't forget that du. <clears throat> now I'm going to substitute back. Okay, so then f prime of x equals secant squared. My u was x over x plus 1 times my du, which is 1 all over x plus 1 quantity squared. Okay. Can I combine? This x plus 1 and that x plus 1? No, you can't. Okay, this is an argument for my secant squared. Okay, this is a multiplier. Okay, I can put this out front, you know, make it look nice, whatever. 1 all over x plus 1 quantity squared times secant squared over x plus 1. We often put these out front so that we don't get confused and think it's a part of like an argument of our secant. Right? You guys um, good with that? I'm sorry about the confusion on the printout. I, I thought I fixed it. Okay. All right, so I'm going to just do one more example. Um, when we think about um, chain rule, we often think about related rates. Okay, so um, chain rules. You've probably had this if you've had calc before. Um, related rates. So I'm thinking about like um, <clears throat> like dy, dx. You know, in terms of my my values. So my dy dx. So like if I have a f of x, right? So I'm going to go. That's df times du times du dx is going to give me d. This is actually dy du. Sorry, dy du. It's like y equals f of x. So dy dx equals dy du times du dx. We, we use this related rate idea um, when we talk about things like example four. We're going back to that sphere again, right? So remember, I've got a sphere. It has a radius r, and our volume of a sphere is 4 third pi r cubed, okay? So this problem says a bunch of things. So given a sphere with radius r, and the radius increases as a rate of at a rate of three centimeters per second. So the radius is changing. That's dr dt. This is at time, right? So this is three centimeters per second. So let's take notes as we're reading the problem. So the radius is changing as a function of time, dr dt. At what rate is the volume of the sphere increasing when r equals 10? So we're looking for dv dt equals what? We don't know. But what we can do is come up with dv dr, right? The change in volume as a function of the change in radius, right? So if we do dv dr, then I can then substitute everything back in for dv dt. So let's write down what these pieces are first. So I'm going to say dv dt, which is um, our rate of change of, oops, volume, right? as a function of time and that equals dv dr. This is our rate of change of volume as a function of radius, rate of change of volume as a function of our radius, our radius changing times dr 
dt, which is our rate of change of radius as a function of time. Rate of change of radius as a function of time. Okay, so they gave me a value of r. So I, I can find dv dr when r equals 10. I was given my radius is changing at, at a constant rate, dr dt. So that's, I can just plug this in. This was equal to 3, all right? Equal to 3. That was given to me at the beginning, right? And then this, dv dr, I can find from my volume equation. So we're going to do this piecemeal, okay? So we're going to take this one step at a time. So volume, 4 thirds pi r cubed. So let's do this out. So dv dr equals <coughs> 4 thirds pi, 4 thirds pi constant, right? So they stay the same. R cubed, I need to take the derivative of R cubed, 3 R squared. Don't forget, dr, dt. This is our chain rule that allows us to put in our rate, our radius is changing at, at a constant rate, okay? So this 3 cancels with this 3, right? So I get 4 pi R squared dr dt, 4 pi R squared dr dt. And like we said before, we were given this, that's equal to 3. So I'm going to plug that in. So my dv dr, 4 pi r squared times 3, <coughs> which is equal to 12 pi r squared. Okay. So dv dr here, but I multiply dv, or once I multiply it by dt, this becomes dv dt. dt. Okay, because I multiplied it by uh, dv dr is this, and then times dv dr dt makes it dv dt, or dv dr times dr dt equals dv dt. So that's what we're doing here. Sorry, I'm trying to make it clear. All right, so now I have dv dt, but I want to find out what's the change in volume when the radius is equal to 10. So when r equals 10, dv dt equals 12 times pi times 10 squared, <coughs> which is equal to 1200, I'm going to leave it in terms of pi, centimeters cubed per second. Okay, it's a rate of change of volume over time. Think about it like this, right? If I had a balloon that was shaped like a sphere and I go to blow it up, right? So when I first start blowing it up, the radius is really small. When I first start blowing it up, the volume changes very rapidly, right? And then as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, like it gets, you know, going and then as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, that rate slows down. So if I check, you know, my rate of change of volume as a function of time at different radius values, this is going to be, you know, getting smaller because, you know, my, it's just think about like the nature of blowing up a balloon that's shaped like a sphere, okay, my change in volume. So we're looking at the change in volume as a function of time, but embedded in that is the change in radius as a function of time, because my radius is changing too. Okay, but they told us that our radius was changing at a constant rate. Okay. All right, you guys, so we'll pick up with this stuff um, when we come back on Monday, and then we'll do a couple more um, examples for um, the chain rule, and then we'll get into inverse functions on Monday. Okay, and then sorry about this. Um, I'm going to move the lecture examples back up to week four, and then um, I'll put up some stuff for week five uh, later um, later today. All right. Good luck with everything. I've, um, don't forget the homework is, homework is due tonight um, at midnight, and then, um, and then we'll start your quizzes today or no later than 11 o'clock tomorrow morning. Okay. Take it easy, guys. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.